33. Had some blessed fellowship. I thank God these days are together and it's been encouraging. And the Word of God speaks to us about that kind of togetherness, that relationship with one another, as well as a relationship with our Lord. And we see that in Psalm 133. Bible unity. Bible togetherness that we can enjoy as brothers and sisters in Christ. As we have relationship with the Father, we have relationship together with our brothers and sisters as well. And so it follows on in that regard. Psalm 133. Let's rise and, uh, and uh, as we read the Word of God together, shall we? Psalm 133. From verse 1 through to 3. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. For our word, uh, your word, that is our word, Lord, the word that you give to us, that we treasure, and for our fellowship together, help us, Lord, to learn of you and to put it into our lives, we pray. For your glory, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Bible unity, Bible togetherness, brethren in unity. Contrast that with... Unity at all costs. We're living in a serious hour today on the church scene. There's much compromise and apostasy. Where Bible truth is not the foundation and the starting point, there's danger. Truth is fallen in the street, we read in Isaiah 59, 14. There's a battle for truth. There's a call for returning to the old paths of sound doctrine, of biblical Christianity, of doctrine and practice that's founded upon his word. Godly unity is what we read of here in Psalm 133. That's what we want to aspire to. Godly unity, biblical unity, where we're joining together as brothers and sisters. Not a joining together that the ecumenical movement would put, where a tolerance of all manner of doctrinal confusion. Really, that is an attack on God's church. Ecumenism, it means literally the whole world. It's the spirit of end times apostasy, an unholy alliance. We've seen that where some leading evangelists now regularly send Roman Catholic converts, so-called, back to the Roman Catholic Church. Where we've seen Roman Catholic priests as members of many ministers' fraternals and Anglican uniting and Catholic churches banding together forming their own theological school in Adelaide, the sixth state of the ecumenical church, brothers and sisters, and it's endemic now. We're seeing same-sex relationships, so-called, uh, uh, occurring amongst the clergy of these <coughs> churches, yet they take no action. The Bible says, Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? In Psalm 133, it's brethren dwelling together in unity. It's not some unity at the expense of biblical truth, where the walls of separation are broken down between truth and error. Friends, the Roman Catholic Church, for example, has turned Christianity into a kind of idolatry with its mass and papacy, the saints and Mary worship. Yet Christians too are getting <coughs> swept along by this as if they can join forces with such error. And yet, friends, today, we cannot, we must not, we must hold fast to the truth and follow the Bible. Because true unity is based on the Word of God. It's based on a common stand, on God's Word, a common salvation, a common faith. As Paul said, speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. Titus 2.1 and the word foretells the Antichrist and the false unity that will come under his control in Revelation 17 and 18. 
And we're forewarned of an apostasy of falling away in many verses. For example, in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. 1 Timothy 4, 1 it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Timothy 3, 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, Deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4. For the time shall come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. As John wants, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And Revelation 17 tells us of a woman on a scarlet coloured beast. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. There is a unity, a false unity, an ecumenical unity. For God's people, we reject that. We want instead... Bible unity, Bible based unity. And so, Bible based unity is very different because it's got a foundation on Bible truth. On Bible truth. If you want to find some meaning or a standard spelling of a word, you go to the dictionary. The dictionary sets the standard for our spelling. Why is there a Bible? It sets the standard for our faith. The word must be our foundation. Not man's views or the latest fads or thinking of men or philosophies or training of men, but the word must be the foundation. Bible unity comes through Bible truth. And we can be certain of our faith. This is not some hope so or think so or suppose so. We know so. Mm -hmm. We know with the apostle, we know the only true God. We know the Son of God is come. We know that judgment of God is against iniquity. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know the Father. We know the Spirit of God. We know the voice of the shepherd. We know that we have passed from death unto life. We know whom we have believed. We can know so. We can know because we have the Word of God to instruct us so. And we are certain of what we believe because of the Bible basis for it. The Bible alone is the basis for the unity that we enjoy as a church of God. That we stand fast with one spirit, with one mind. Philippians 1 verse 27. That we speak the same things, being perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Philippians 2.2. 2, we're like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What a wonderful bond there is. It's a bond, not a bondage, but a bonding together. A brother and brother, of sister and sister, of that blessed unity. How blessed it is. How good it is. How pleasant it is, the psalmist says, when Bible unites believers in the bonds of love and peace. In the one church. And of course there's different churches represented here this morning. Because we are like-minded in the faith. Assembling separately, yet, of that one church of God. Bible truth, it leads to Bible unity. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's a unity in the Holy Spirit. There's a unity in that one faith of Ephesians 4.13. So we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And friends, we can be encouraged this morning to, to know the Bible truth that underpins the Bible unity that we can enjoy. As we follow the Bible together, as we're assembled in accord with His Word, in accord with the order of it, and in the doctrine of it. And God makes us a symphony together. Different ones playing different parts as 
We like as a church for everyone to play some role where we can exercise biblical doctrine and practice and be playing together as a symphony of different instruments in harmony. And so as a Bible church, we want to guard against disunity. We know, for example, in 1 Corinthians there was much of that. Uh, from, For example, 1 verse 12, there are contentions among you. We need to be guarded about that. And as we have brotherly love, as we exercise brotherly love, we can overcome such disunity. In Romans 14.1 it talks about doubtful disputations. Personal preferences that, uh, again, can be a cause for conflict. True Bible unity comes as not necessarily that we're clones of one another, all uh, exactly practicing the same things, but that we're in accord with the Word of God. That the Word of God sets the uh, course for our lives. That we're in a sound Bible-based church where we care about the Bible. We care about truth and purpose that God will give to us. We care about our relationship with God, which is the ultimate objective. And we uphold His Word and spread the Gospel. It's like someone puts it, ten men banded together in love and unity can do what 10,000 separately would fail to do. Unity in the church is something we long for, we hunger for. That blessed unity of Psalm 133. How good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it comes as we have the love of His Word, the love of the truth. It changes our whole life, our whole lifestyle. Back in the early church days, there was a martyr called Lucian of Antioch. And they, the persecutors said to Lucian, Where do you come from? He replied, I am a Christian. What's your business? Who's your family? I am a Christian. To Lucian, Christ was all. Christ was all. Whether of country, of occupation, of family. The cross revolutionises our lives. The cross revolutionises our relationships and our life. And like Lucian, we have that one allegiance to Christ alone. To Christ alone. That brings that unity for our lives. And that's what the Word shows to us as the early church. They were standing fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the Gospel. Working together. Bible truth underpins that Bible unity. And when we've got Bible truth, it leads to Bible contention. Contention. Now that sounds like a contradiction really, doesn't it? Unity, but contention. Of course we're talking about godly contention. There is such a thing as godly contention. And I'm not talking about argumentativeness for argument's sake or people trying to outwit one another with theological debate. Mm -hmm. But Jude 3, Jude 1, 3, that familiar one, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. There's a contention for Bible faith. A contention for the truth. To stand strongly for it. To stand for the absolute truth of it. As Paul did, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know, sadly, these days there's much to be desired on the church front. Compromise, softness, wishy-washiness, weakness, watered-down words. There's gospels being preached that aren't the gospel. There's converts being claimed that aren't converts. We need more than ever before to stand, to rise up and stand. As Jude urged the people to contend earnestly for the faith. For the faith. We're contending for something. We're contending for the cause of righteousness and truth. To call sin, sin. To declare the absolute truth of God's word. We've got something worth fighting for. Fighting for. Truth on fire. Be willing to carry the reproach of the cross. Be willing to be outspoken. Not that we're out to put 
people under condemnation or tie them up in knots. But we've got something that is worth contending for. To plead with people to be saved. To cry out the message. To extend His grace. To extend His invitation. To reach out in His love, in His compassion to those that know Him not. To be willing to be outspoken. Bold. Angry at the devil. What the devil is doing to our nation. To what the devil is doing to our communities. To be zealous for the truth. To stand for it. To reprove, to rebuke, to exhort. They're contending words. Contending words. It means to fight, to combat, to battle. And we are to do it half-heartedly. Does he say contend half-heartedly for the faith? He says contend earnestly for the faith. Have you lost your earnestness for the kingdom? That earnestness, that, that longing to be his, to be about what he would have you to be about, that relationship that he longs for. I've been challenged already this morning by that, just the thought of that. That earnestness, have we lost it? Finney has in Numbers 25, he was zealous for his God. Zealous for his God. Are we like those in Jeremiah 9 verse 3, when they're looking for some men, they couldn't find hardly any men. Valiant for the truth. Valiant for the truth. Men who are willing to be part of the army of God. Not as conscripts, not as drafted, but as volunteers. To say, yes Lord, yes Lord, send me, use me. To step forward for the fight. The fight against sin in our own lives. To fight against sin in the churches. As we see 1 Corinthians, it's all about that. To fight against false teachers and false doctrine. As Paul in Galatians. Against hypocrisy and evil among Christian leaders. There's a time to contend. Bible contention. Truth has fallen in the streets. We need more than ever to be zealous for our God. To be valiant for the truth. Because the quicksand of compromise is all about us. Where some uh, have just lost complete sight of it. The truth has got so watered down. It's hard to discern it. In many places today. And we ought to be militant. For what matters. Friends, we've talked about Bible truth. That must be the foundation stone. Bible contention. It's not a contending to make argument, to cause squabbles and petty differences amongst believers. We'll always have that. We'll always have different views, different learnings, different backgrounds, different ways of seeing things. And that's not an unhealthy thing. It's like a diamond has got many facets. We can see from different angles of that said there are things we must say thus saith the Lord there are some things there's no questioning about and for those we must contend and lastly Bible truth leads us to Bible separation Bible separation that's a bit of a dirty word too some mock at that some would say uh, almost mockingly be ye separate you know as if it's some weird kind of thing some kind of not trendy to be separate anymore but there is a biblical separation. And again, it's not that we've got to walk around like the Amish or, or be something that looks strange or weird. But we need to find for ourselves, what does the Bible say to me? And I must obey it. And who cares what others might think? I will be true to my conscience. I will be true to the Bible truth that even if I'm unpopular and even if... Others might neglect it. I will be true to it. I will be true to what God instructs me to do. As I understand it to be. And Bible separation it is a very important Bible doctrine. It's an important responsibility for us. As we urged in 1 John 5. Keep yourselves from idols. We must keep separate from idols. We've heard how even religious things can become idols. We must ensure a purity in our relationship with God. And be aware that the God of this world is always about to attract and snare us. Be separate from worldliness that feeds the old nature. Have no fellowship with anyone or anything 
That's disobedience to the word of God. In Ephesians 5.11, Paul says, but rather reprove them. <coughs> reprove them. Those things that are out of accord with him, we are to reprove, to speak against. We are to reject heretics. Titus 3, verse 10. That is one who denies Bible truth. Of course, the word urges us to restore people too. It's not that we are to view another as if they're beyond redemption, but to restore those that might have false teaching. To urge them to Bible truth, to guide them, to be understanding the word. Yet there are some of whom their words are likened to a canker. That means a spreading, eating sore. We don't want the body to be harmed by that which would hurt. As, as a spreading, eating sore would, as a canker would. And 2 Timothy 2, 16 to 17 says that that is something we need to be guarded against in the, in the church of God. And being separate means withdrawing from doctrinal error. We're not to be yoked together with that, to be identified with that, but rather to be identified with the holiness of God instead. A love for that. A separation to Christ and from the world. And so, friends, we liken it to the Israelites. They were separate from the heathen nations. We're a nation, as it were, a new nation. God's people. We're commanded to not be unequally yoked or tied together with unbelievers, but to come out and to cleanse ourselves, to perfect holiness in the fear of God. So for every one of us, we all need to consider what does that mean? What is God speaking to me in my life? How can I be more separated unto God? How can I be more avoiding of sin in my life? How can I rather seek to please the Lord with how I live, to honour Him? Not something that I can do so that I can brag about it, but because I hold the book dear, because I hold the demands of that book dear and true, I will obey them. And so for all of us, through our lives, we need to exercise that discernment. As Paul urged, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21. To judge between the true and the false. And to obey that scripture in Revelation 18 verse 4. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. There is a command there. Come out. Come out. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We've had some lovely fellowship. We've had uh, new brothers and sisters we've met through these days of the camp. We want that unity. That unity. Biblical unity. A unity that's based on a love for the Bible truth. Bible truth. And that Bible truth is something we want to have Bible contention for. To contend for the faith. Earnestly for it. And to have that Bible fellowship that is a separation a separation unto God because we want to be a holy people, a holy people again not that we have anything to brag about, that we're holier than thou, that our church or our churches are any uh, more needing of his grace than any other church because ultimately and absolutely we're all weak. And every church can find a fault. And every man can be faulty. And the minute we think we've got it all together is the minute that we'll fall. As the Bible says, if you think you're not going to fall, take heed mm -hmm. you know, to yourself. Mm -hmm. Take heed if you think you're not going to fall, because you will. And uh, so at all times we need to have that humility of mind. That marks the people of God. Friends, to close, Bible truth. It means a faith that's founded in Christ, in His Word, in what He tells us. A Bible unity that is prompting us to contend, to cry out, to urge 
others to see Christ, to receive his truth, to know his salvation and a Bible separation that we want to be his and live like it, to, to know his grace and to make it real in our lives. Mm. And there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come uh, in the mercy of God. We can come because you've made the way open to us by your blood. We can have access into the holiest. We can have relationship with you, Lord, despite our unworthiness, despite our worthlessness of ourselves. Yet, Lord, you've made us worthy because of the blood that you shed for us. And Lord, help us to be stirred. Help us to be a biblical people. Help us to be a people that count your truth important, that apply it in our lives. We pray if there's any here that have yet to trust you, that even now they might see their great lack, their great need, and bow their hearts and bow their will to you. And for all of us, Lord, that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that none of us would think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but that we would all be subject one to another, that we would be brothers and sisters growing together, exhorting one another, edifying one another in Bible truth and to Bible separation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.